these words. Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who has set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength. Because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider the heavens, the work of your hands, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea that pass through the path of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Father God, we thank you now. God, we glorify you. Lord, we lift you, we praise you. Lord, we thank you for another privilege to come before you. Lord, we thank you, Father God, that we realize now that you are the awesome God. That you, Father God, are the excellent God. There is no God like you, God. And we thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you this morning that you are mindful of man, that you are kind to mankind, that you created us a little lower than the angels, and Lord, you have given us dominion over the beasts of the field, the fowls of the air, the fish of the sea. God, you have given us dominion over this whole world, and Lord, we come today realizing that we've fallen short. God, we messed up. We've not done the things that are pleasing in your sight. We have sinned by omission and commission. God, we ask you to forgive us this morning. That nothing will stand between you and us. We pray that you bless us now. Hold us now, Father God. Bless your word to go forth. That life will be made the better. That children, men, women, boys, and girls will reach you and reach others. Now, Lord, we ask you to continue to give us the victory. Lord, we thank you for the victory. We thank you for victory over death, hell, and the grave. Lord, we thank you for the victory, Father God, that the enemy has no place. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us in this service, that this service, Father God, would be what you have it to be, that lives will be changed, hope will be renewed, strength will be restored, that men, women, boys, and girls will see you as never before. That we will see you, Father God, as the God who sits high and looks low. Now, Lord, we ask you to keep us now. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And thank God.
God, for your, your consideration, we're looking at Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3. When you found it, you will find these words, New King James Version. Now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make you your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. And in you all families of the earth shall be blessed. I want to ask the question this morning. Do you believe God? Do you believe, you may be seated, do you believe, believe God? Do you believe, not the person next to you, not the person you left at the house. The question is, do you believe God? The year was 1985. The month was January. I left my hometown in Indianola, Mississippi to make my way 600 miles away to a big city called Houston, Texas. The year was 1985, the month was January. So it was January 1985. At the age of 22, I left Indianola, Mississippi. At that time, population around 12,000. To make my way to a population in Houston, Texas of 3 million. All the bright lights, all the traffic, all the unhospitable people that I encountered the moment my feet struck the ground. Matter of fact, I was driving in and didn't have any family, couldn't even find, you know, they, I didn't have a secular phone then. <laughs> I was only going by a map, and at that time I carried a map everywhere I went. Uh -huh. All right. I left the, the, the small city of Indianola, Mississippi in the heart of the Mississippi Delta, where I grew up chopping cotton and, and watching others pick cotton, to a, a mega metropolitan area called Houston, Texas. The question became to me then, and the question to you I asked this morning, do you trust God? I mean, I, I, I left because I was real mad. I left because I couldn't fit in. I left because I didn't have the job that I deserved. I was, I, I had just been hired a year and a, a half prior to that time at the Lewis Grocery Company, later known as Super Value, and, and I walked in and I applied for a job. They accepted my resume, they accepted my application, they accepted me as a brand new employee, and the promise was made to me. Since you're the only person who has interviewed with an electronics degree, when something becomes available, we'll just slide you into position. I had a promise, and he said, as of now, we're going to give you an engineering position. It's going to be a sanitation engineering job. And I said, oh, thank you, sir. I, I can do that. So my job was sanitation engineering. 
And then because I accepted it as a sanitation engineer, I knew in a few more months I will have a maintenance job at the Lewis Grocery Company, repairing forklifts and, and making sure that computers ran right and PLCs in place and making sure my binary numbers lined up. I just knew I saw it in my mind. I saw it in my heart. I just knew I was getting ready to be an electronic engineer. But at first, there was no open. So I had to accept the position in this long title called sanitation engineer. I worked four different shifts a week. I worked on Sunday. And when the guy came in the break room, I already had the coffee made. I was a good sanitation engineer. When the guys bursted uh, pallets and, and bursted bottles along the aisle, I would run with my mop on my scooter and my dustpan in the room. And I would clean it up. I had developed a reputation as a great sanitation engineer. All right. I went in at 3 to 11 twice a week. I went in, went in from 7 to, to, to 2 some weeks. I went in from 8 to 12 and, and from 12 to 3 some weeks. And then I worked on something. I, I had a smiling face every time I walked in. And all of a sudden it happened. About a year and a half, it happened. About a year and a half into the job, three positions became available and I was looking forward to it. I applied just for, for one of them. Uh, uh, Three positions became available for an engineering technician, an electronic technician, and an electronic engineer. So I applied, and they brought in three guys from the outside. Not within the company, from the outside that didn't look like me. I'm in Mississippi in the 80s. They brought three guys in and they hired them and put them in those three positions. So, you know, I have to be diplomatic about it. So I, I took the long stairway up to the manager's office and I visited with Mr. Tom Patterson. I didn't have an appointment. I didn't talk to his, his secretary about it, but I just walked up the stairway, knocked on the door. He, re, he, he received me and I asked the question, Mr. Tom Patterson, why wouldn't I consider for one of those positions? All 380 pounds, six foot seven man leaned across the desk and looked me dead in the eye. And he said to me, I hire who I want to. And I put them where I want them to be. I stood up and I looked him in the eye and I said, thank you, sir. I walked downstairs and all of my vacation I had stored up. For, for 1984, I moved it, I canceled it, and moved it over to, to 1985. I had a plan. So in January of 1985, I made my way to Houston, Texas. All right. Back home, I could, I could ride around the corner and get in my car, ride around the corner, get out of my car, and clock in in seven minutes. In Houston, Texas, I could drive nearly an hour and still not be there. <laughs> but I had something in my head, I had something in my heart that just could not keep me there. Uh -huh. I came out here, I began to look for a job. At that time, they had what they called the classified. Google wasn't on the scene. Right. I would look in the classified every single day, and as I looked in the classified, I found a job. I went and I talked to the people. And on my way to the job, on my way to the interview, runner, my car quit. And it quit on, on, on West Park and, and Hillcroft. My car quit. I got on the payphone as a, as, a, as a prospective employee should do. And, and I called the man and said, I am running late. The secretary said, he's not here. I'll take a message. I said, let him know I'm running late, but I'm on my way, my car quit. Between the time I, I made that phone call and the time I reached the point, they gave the job away. I still got walking in. During that time, you wore a, a tie 
and a suit to interviews. I struck out walking. I struck out walking. And, and in, you know how it feels in the summertime, don't you? <laughs> in Houston. And you know how it feels in January in Houston. Uh, the confusion of the seasons get confused very easily in Houston, especially when you've got a tie and a suit and a button-up shirt on. When I got there, I was drenched. And the lady said, well, let me, he went to lunch. I said, I'll sit and wait. Brother, let me just share with you. Mr. Fountainot came back from lunch and he said, man, you know, we don't have that position available anymore. He said, but you said that your car quit. I thought you wasn't coming. Because that's the irresponsibility of most young people. He said, I just gave the job away right before I went to lunch. He said, but how did you get here? I said, I walked. He said, we got to find something for you. So he called another manager, and this other manager brought me in as a technician. I left Mississippi for 16 cents an hour. And it's because if they didn't give me a shot then, they were never going to give me a shot. So here I am, and life has been up and down, but it's been getting sweeter and sweeter round by round. Such it is in the text. <laughs> when we look at the text, we find Abram, later known as Abraham. You see, Abram, this particular three verses, these particular three verses identify Abram's past, present, and his future. If you look at history, you look at history, the theologians believe that Abram grew up in a community and in a household that were idol worshipers. And Abram had idol worshiping throughout his life. Matter of fact, theologians say that Abram, Terah, Abram's daddy, Abram's daddy had an idol worshiping shop where he sold little whatnots for worshiping. And one day, Abram was so upset with the idol worshiping, he took it upon himself to break up some of the idols. He broke up some of the idols in his daddy's shop, and then he went outside the door and began to discourage people from buying any more whatnots for worshiping idols. Uh, Abram's daddy was so upset until he took him to Nimrod the king. When he took him to Nimrod the king, Nimrod fired up the hot fiery furnace. So you thought that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was the only one thrown in the furnace. Nimrod fired up the hot, fiery furnace. He threw Abram in the furnace, and God delivered him and saved him even from the furnace. Then Abram had a brother. Abram's brother believed the God of Abram. And they threw Abram's brother in the fire. And God did not deliver him. God delivered Abram because, first of all, he trusted the almighty living God. Let me share with you, God will account it to your credit if you just trust God. Right. Things around you, people around you may be doing any and everything. God has called you to trust him and trust him alone. Yeah, people, it may be in your nation. It may be in your family. It may be in the people around you, but God has, has called you to trust him. The Bible says, the Apostle Paul says in, in Romans chapter 4, that it was credited toward Abram as faith because he trusted God. So because Abram trusted God, God gave him faith. And we pick it up in this text because Abram had to leave. I mean, if you're a troublemaker, you ought to leave. <laughs> Rather than stay in Indianola, Mississippi and be sad and sovereign, I just took the point in my life to get out of there. The text declares in verse number one, now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country. What he's saying is, what he's saying is get from around those familiar territories you're in. Get from around where you grew up. Get from around this country. Let me just share with you. Ever since I just love visiting Mississippi, I love it. It's a hospitality state. 
They know how to cook. They know how to treat you. See, in Louisiana, they give you something to drink when you show up. In Mississippi, they give you something to eat when you show up. See, what we have to understand is that regardless of how comfortable you have become, God has something better for you. Regardless of how your situation is, regardless of how, how you like it, regardless of how many people you like to be around, all of your friends. For young people, you need to understand your friends do not set your agenda for you. God sets your agenda for you. So God says, first of all, get out of your country. Secondly, he says, get from around your people. Leave your family. There are some churches that are full of family members. And if you think about going to another church, you are stoned to death. <laughs> Verbally. <laughs> you will walk past without speaking. It's because some things we have to pull away from, and even sometimes it becomes my family. When, it's, when, it, when they're opposed to godliness, we got to walk away from them. Sometimes you have to get to a point in your life where you're going to trust God, even though you, God has not shown up in your family. Even though you weren't brought up in church, even though church has not been on the agenda, even though God has not been what you've been used to, you have to get along with the Lord. And he says, leave your country, get away from your family, and then he says, get away from your father's house. See, it, it, it wasn't uncommon during those days, and it's becoming not so uncommon today either, where children stayed in the same house with their mom and dad. They spend their time growing up in this house. And, and he says, get away from your father's house. Because I want to say to you today, if you're in another man's house, even if it's your father's house, that man sets the standard. And you have to carry yourself and worship the way that man says worship. You have to carry yourself and worship and spend time with God the way he says to spend time with God. So God says to Abram, even leave your father's house. Can't you see mothers sitting and crying? Can't you see that people are very upset, number one, because he left the country? Number two, because he left his kindreds? And number three, because he left the father's house. And sometimes leaving your father's house is not just leaving for another location. It is leaving behind all those things that you've been taught growing up. You know, Halloween, Halloween is, is around, it's today, isn't it? Well, my, 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 Halloween, Halloween, you know, people grow up playing with Ouija boards. Say that. People grow up looking, looking at their monthly prognostication, zodiac signs. People grow up every single day that the newspaper comes out. I'm used to seeing people looking for their horoscope, Satan. When the Bible says, leave your father's house, leave is not just another location. It is also the things that you grew up knowing. Many times we want to stick to what we know. It's, it's easy. It's easy. Even in the church, we got traditions that we stuck to. We've been stuck with. Even in the church. Even in the church. When I grew up, they would roll the, 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 the uh, communion out. And when they rolled the communion out, it had a cloth over the top. And, and it had a thing sticking up here, a thing sticking up here. And as a little boy, and then it had a solid point right here. As a little boy, I said, they done rolled out another dead person. Because they made it so mysterious. And they were rolling out in cover. But what I didn't understand is the people who started it, they started it covering up the communion because they had flies around. And we don't have the flies that they used to have. And we don't worship outside. So there's no reason to cover it up. We ought to have it exposed so men, women, boys, and girls can appreciate the beauty of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Yeah. Even in the church, even in the church, I see, I see our ushers today got on color stuff. In the old Baptist church, if you didn't have on black and white, you in trouble. You almost going to hell. It's the traditions that have been put 
on us year after year after year and we live behind it. But when you leave your father's house, your earthly father's house, you have to leave the junk that's been instilled in you. In our church back home, only certain people could get on this platform. And so therefore, when, when we designed this building, you notice that we didn't design it with a pulpit in mind. We designed it as a stage. We didn't design it where only the preacher could come by. I mean, if a boy would run in the pulpit and he had not been called, I mean, everybody in the church, especially the old sisters, would be like, boy, don't you dare do that. You would get an everlasting beating. Therefore, when this is a pulpit, the preacher is preaching. And the pulpit is designed to pull the people out the pit. So the word of God will pull us out the pit if we hang on to what's said from the pulpit. But the moment Sister Chris Noble walks up here is no longer a pulpit. It has become a stage. It has become, the, the moment Sister David seen from behind here is no longer a pulpit. Now that kind of shenanigan back home would really get me in trouble. Have you noticed that we don't have the petition right here that they would have in the normal pulpit? And I know you have noticed that we don't have a, a high chair here and some lower chairs there and then some lower, lower chairs there. Because the king does not sit in the chair. The king is still on the throne in heaven. He's the only king that sits on the throne. We have to get to a point where we leave our father's house. We leave the mentality. We leave the hardship. We leave the stuff that we've been enduring for years. And then there are some denominations that says, women, you shouldn't have on makeup. Even with your mask on, you shouldn't have on makeup. Because makeup is not godly. And sisters, you better not wear a miniskirt in here. And if you mess around and decide it's too cold for you to wear a dress today, and you put on some britches, <laughs> that means that you're really going to hell because you wear what men ought to be wearing. The problem with that mentality is that when I leave this country and I go to other countries, the men in the other countries wear what we would call a dress. And the women in that country wears what we call pants. So let me unpack that scripture and let you know that when it says that women should not wear any garment that is of a man, it means you ought not wear pants that are made for men. And, and, and it is, it's, it's really easy to understand because if God was more concerned about your britches, he wouldn't be concerned about your hearts. Some places, women can't even wear boots. Lord have mercy. We, this sent us up in here. We, women can't wear boots to church. It's because the tradition has been taught that women should not wear boots because women should not be cowboys either. Now, for a lot of women, for a lot of women, when I say you shouldn't be cowboys, really, that team in Dallas should not be somebody you're cheering for. You see how senseless it is, how much time we waste spending God's quality time when we should be reaching souls for Jesus Christ. We should be inclusive and instead of exclusive. So he says, leave that kind of shenanigan alone. Leave the idol worshiping. And see, we may not worship what not now, but now we worship Lexus, BMW, Ford, Chevrolet. We worship houses and land. We worship, how you know? Because the church are not full. We don't have to put out more church chairs today. We don't have to worry about, about spacing people out because of COVID-19. That's a problem. It's time for everybody to get back on board and get back into the swing of things simply because God has made a way out of no way. God has kept us. And for two years, I have refrained from making this statement, but it's really time now. You go everywhere else. You do everything else. 
You spend time doing other things that you want to do. But I can't go to the church as if we got a bucket of COVID-19 sitting at the door. And we're going to dump it on you when you walk in. I see people flying. People swimming. People dancing. People partying. People having fun. And then they, they use the children for an excuse. This is his first birthday and we just wanted to celebrate and 15 people get COVID. We have to get to a, a situation in our lives where we understand that God is God. And Brother Whitlock said that we ought to worship, we ought to praise that God. And I tend to agree that if we're going to cheer for the soon-to-be World Series champions, surely, surely we ought to cheer for the Almighty God. And if we're going to waste our time, uh, spending our time <laughs> cheering for the Houston Texans that's tearing their own team apart day by day, certainly we ought to honor the Almighty God. I mean, we are so upset because of the saga. We are so bent out of shape because our, our defense in the end is gone. Uh, our wide receiver is no longer with us. And now they got a quarterback, a world-class quarterback, sitting on the shelf making money. Yeah. And we can't brag about the Texas. Let me tell you, we ought to boast about God. We ought to brag about God. We ought to say our thing about God. We ought to celebrate God. The Bible says, Abraham, leave your country. Yeah your friends, your family members, and your father's house. He says, and I will show you a land. I will show you a land that will become a great nation. He personifies this thing, and he says, I will make you a great nation. He said to Abraham, Abraham, I tell you what I would do. I will make you a great people. He's saying to Abraham, because you trust me, because you believe in me, because you have chosen to worship me, and you have chosen not to give in to peer pressure, I'm going to make you, Abraham, a great nation. You're going to be a great people. In other words, the people who are connected to you will be great. Who are you connected with? Who are you connected to that's pulling you down, that's draining you? That always, you always got to be the one that pays. You always have to be the one who drives. You always have to be the one that gives. Who is pulling you down and draining you? Sometimes you got to walk away from family and friends. That's right. That's right. He says, Abraham, I will go to this land and I will show you this land and I will make you a great nation. And when he says a great nation, he means a great people. In other words, Abraham, other folk will be blessed. The whole nation will be blessed because of you. Yeah. Is the Lord blessing other folk through you? I do other folk hate to see you coming. The moment they hear your voice, do they say, oh Lord, I thought you were going to spare me this time. God God wants to use you, not just Abraham. He wants to use you to bless the entire nation. Our president, our governor, our mayor, they can only do just a few things. And most of the time they choose not to do it for you. They can only do just a few things and they're limited in what they do. That's why the election right now, the, the, the midterm election, and the election where there are no, no national stage and no national presence, this is the time for you to vote because they directly affect you. And it's always those who didn't vote. I ain't going down there. They're going to do what they want to do anyway. It's always those who don't vote who have the biggest complaint. It's always those who have come to the conclusion, well, the presidential election is not happening, so I'm not going to participate anyway. It's time for you to move beyond that mindset. Move beyond that theory, because it's just a ghost theory. It's just a theory that somebody conjured up in their mind. It's time for us to move forward and allow God to bless others through us. The blessings you have are not all for you. The blessings you have is to bless other people. 
The blessings you have is to pour out blessings upon other people. And let me tell you, you can't be God's giving. No matter how you try. The more you give, the more he gives to you. And that is no lie. You can't be God giving. Even the stinger folk will say amen on that one. Brother, brother said the other day, man, folk just giving you stuff. I said, you're right. Bag up two months from there, the same guy said, Pastor, every time you see somebody, you find out a way, an opportunity to give something away. People show up on the bike trail. This is your first time here. Take this. I went shopping. Got a whole big old plastic bucket in there. Somebody show up for the first time. Here, you take that. And what I give away is nothing to be compared to what God is giving back to me. I told you I should have been dead a long time ago. I should have been out of here, but God just keeps giving to me. He gives me health. He gives me strength. He, he gives me air. He gives me a heartbeat. He just keeps giving to me. So the same guy who said to me, Pastor, you just keep giving away stuff. Everybody show up. You find something to give. I'm telling you, you have to have the attitude of giving. You have to have an attitude of taking what God has blessed you with and bless others with it. Because if you have the right attitude in giving unto others, God will bless you. And the Bible teaches that he will not only bless you with what you gave away, he will give you good measure, pressed down, shaking together and running over. So on the bike trail, I'm giving away these little gadgets, right? I'm giving away a light here, a signal here. I'm giving away a seat cover here. I'm just giving away little bitty gadgets. I mean, look, I mean stuff sometimes that doesn't even cost $10. I'm, I'm just giving away. Give it to anybody, just show up. And then if people have gotten something before, just give it more. And I've always said that I would never, ever pay $3,000 for a bicycle. I've always said I would never pay $5,000 for a bicycle. I said, my cheeks just have to hurt if I got to pay $6,000, $5,000, $2,000 for a bike. And when it stopped hurting, I'd get off and I'd stretch a little bit and get back on it. I had always said that I will not pay, and I mean that I will not pay $2,000 for a bicycle. Amen. But because of the giving spirit, just the other day, my neighbor came across the street and said, I need you to mentor my daughter in engineering. And as a gift to you, here, you can take this bike. I told you, I'm not going to pay $2,000 for this bike. I'm not going to pay that kind of money for nothing that I can sit on. He said, here, you can have this bike. You can take this bike. And he said, he said here, you, it's yours. All I want you to do is anytime my daughter has a question about engineering, you just answer her engineering question. So the other day, she, she called me, and I spent 20 minutes asking her engineering question. And the bike is worth $7,500. Y'all didn't get help, y'all missed it. I answered a question in engineering. It took me 20 minutes, Brother Miles, to answer this question. And I was able to do it on the phone. And then his, her daddy delivered to me a, a bicycle. Now check this out. It's not a bike that he, 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 he want anymore. And it's all right to me. I grew up with handing me down. I'm good. Right. He, he gave me a $7,500 bicycle, brother. It rides good. Yeah. It moves well. Sister David picked it up yesterday and said, ooh, this bike is light. I hope she doesn't have anything in mind like she's going to get one. She said, ooh, this bike is light. <laughs> it, it, it cruises. After you stop paddling, Sister Irvin, it just cruises along. And I'm able to cruise along beside guys that's struggling in paddling. They used to leave me behind. Matter of fact, I said, man, I can't be wearing them biker shorts. My wife didn't want me on the trail with these biker shorts on. And they said, you, you, you tell your wife she ain't got to worry about us looking at you because you always behind anyway. <laughs> but now, Sister Roxy, when we're going downhill, I don't have to paddle anymore. Uh -huh. 
I just cruise down here. When we're on our way back uphill, I look around me, and they're about 50 yards behind me, and they're pedaling like they're trying to get there. And it's not because I have gotten so much more developed than they have. It's only because of a gift. And I was giving away $5 gifts, $2 gifts, five, $3 gifts here and there. And I have come upon, because I have given Sister Nanlo a $7,500 bicycle. And I've already put several scratches on it. Because I don't worship it. I worship the Almighty God. In, in the text, Genesis chapter 12, the Bible says that he will allow God, God will, will bless Abram in order to bless others. The next thing he says, I will bless you. Amen. Look at the order in which he puts it. He says, Abraham, you're going to bless other people. And then, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm so glad that I don't have to depend on other people to bless me because God has promised that he will bless me. And this word bless in the original Hebrew, the word bless means to abundantly increase your favor. I told you, I don't need money. Why do I need money? Why do I need money to buy a bike when a man just walks across the street and says, yeah, it's yours. I wasn't going to buy it. I don't need to admire it. I don't, I don't even go in the store to look at it, but he just said, yeah, that's yours. And what you have to understand, as you are a giver, God will make you a great nation as you bless others. God says, I'm going to bless you. And see, when you bless others, you bless others as they need. But when God bless you, the text declares that he gives you abundantly increase above anything that you can ask or think. So when you walk with God, some things you want to talk to God about and ask God about, he already has it for you. You just keep blessing others. You just keep giving for others. Keep doing for others. And then the next thing he says, in verse, in, in, in verse number two, he says, and I will make you a great, make your name great. Meaning he will make you famous. People all over the world will get to know you, and in that fame, they want to respect you. You see, we thought that the pandemic was going to kill the church. We thought that the pandemic would shut it down. We thought that even small churches would go out of business. But the way God does it, he blesses us up above and beyond what we can even ask or think. Where I used to preach to 50 and 75 on Sunday, now I'm able to preach to 300. And then if they don't get it that time, they can walk back and I can preach to 3,000. So whatever you're going through, whatever your situation is, just understand this real well. God is behind the scene working it out on your behalf. He says, not only will, will you bless others, I will bless you. I will make you a great nation. I will make your name great. I will make you famous. And here I am. Little snotty nose, running boy from the backwoods of Mississippi. Being televised all over the world. Teaching uh, in five and eight different languages now. It's not because I'm smart. It's because God has given me favor over and abundantly above anything that I can ask or think. Is God in control? It is God. God says, I'll make you famous. And this fame that God gives us is not so we can brag about it. It's for him to be able to hear us brag about him. You ought to be bragging about God. And you ought to be bragging. You can start by saying he kept me all night long. You can start by saying he woke me up this morning. See, somebody thought it was honey nudging them. Somebody thought it was a alarm clock that woke them up this morning. But I'm here to tell you right now, right here, it was none of those things. It was the, the finger of love of the almighty God who has blessed us again and blessed us again. And we don't even deserve it says he'll bless you. He will give you abundantly above all you can ask and think he will. And then check this out. If other folk bless you, God will bless them. Yes, right. <laughs> Look at what it says in the text. In the text it says, and you shall be a blessing. You're going to bless other people 
you're going to dispense good everywhere. And then in verse number three, he says, and I will bless those who bless you. If you bring a prophet a glass of water, you will be blessed. He says, if people in your circle chooses to bless you, then I'm going to bless them. That's why I know how to take a blessing. <laughs> Brother Whitlock offered me that $5,000 the other day. I just said, oh man, you don't have to do that. I said, man, thank you so much. God bless you, God keep you, and God be with you. You know, people come up with this false sense of humility. Uh, they come up with this false sense of humbleness. They, they say, oh, you didn't have to do that. You had it to me, I'm gonna take it. Because I understand one thing very well. You can't be blessed of God unless you bless others. And I sure don't want to cut your blessings off from you. So Sister Jackie Jackson walks up to me with that 2,000, 2,500 today. I'm going to say, Sister, God bless you. He's been a plenty. God bless you. Hallelujah. We're going to shop together. We gonna, let's get our tambourine, our drums. Let's get our organ. Let's get our pipe. We're going to celebrate together. So don't think I'm crazy when I walk out of here and, and dancing and shouting. It's because the Lord has blessed me through her. See, God will allow other people to bless you because you bless him. And because you bless others. Let me tell you, if you're down on your luck and you don't have what you really need, you start blessing other people. I mean, when you get when you get to a point where where you just don't have what you need, look for a way to bless somebody, and then God will bless you through other people. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. He says, "I will bless those who bless you," and then he says, "It should be however, I will curse him who curses you." The Bible the Bible teaches really well. Touch not my anointing. Do my prophets no harm. And let me tell you, just because it says touch not my anointing and do my prophet no harm, it's not just the preacher. What he's saying is this word curse means to talk bad about you. Don't worry about folk talking bad about you. Don't worry about people shutting you down. Don't worry about people giving you a bad name because God has a way of cursing them. It says, it says, it says right here that I will curse those who curse you. <laughs> I will, I will shut them down. I will cut them off. They will be doing worse than you are. That's why we in the church, we can't talk about children of other folk, children and how they gone astray, how they climbing up fools here. Just keep waking up in the morning. It doesn't matter how much Jesus you put in there. Sooner or later, your child going to be climbing up fools here. That's why the church is called to economy. Economy means to build up, to, to magnify, to lift somebody's spirit. We need to understand that it's our responsibility to build up one another, to build up other folks, to build up other people's children, to lift their spirit. Economy. We are here to build up each other. Girl, did you hear her boy went to prison the other day? You ought to shut up, sit down somewhere. Because you ain't so holy that you have not done anything. And if you don't have any children, let me tell you, you've done enough to mess up yourself. We have to understand that God blesses us as we bless others, as we build them up. Have a kind word for each other. And finally, verse 3, Genesis chapter 12, says to us today, and in you, all families of the earth will be blessed. You ought to be living your life to leave a legacy for young people to follow. You ought to build your life in such a way that they see how you trust God. I, I talk to parents sometimes that they can't get their children up to go to church. They can't get their children up to, to sweep to clean the room. They can't get their children up to, to go to school. I didn't have that luxury growing up. <laughs> they didn't have time out when I was a child. They didn't have time, time out for the woods. There was no such thing as time out. They would talk to you very softly and make you feel miserable. I mean, when somebody, you know they're mad at you. 
and they talk very calmly to you. Daddy didn't come in the house. I'm going to kick you. He didn't come in the house. They didn't cuss around us. Daddy just with his gentle spirit said, okay, go. Go in your bedroom and lay across the bed. I mean, tears just start coming down. I mean, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't raise his voice. And you didn't contend with him. He wasn't going to fight you. You wasn't going to run. If you run, you got a real problem. And mama said, go outside and get your own switch. You come back with a switch this long if you want to. Okay, if I have to go get it, I'll get a real switch. What you have to understand is that we have to teach children when they're young how to deal with real life. We even have to teach them, as I said last week, how to lose. Because this world is a world where you are not. The songwriter said, all I do is win, win, win. All I do is win. I, I'm telling you, all my life I have not just won. That's right. We have to teach our children that somebody's not going to like you. And somebody's not going to cater to you. Somebody's going to walk over you. Tell them the truth and let them know this is a doggy dog world. But if you stay with the Lord, the Lord can bless you. The Lord can keep you. The Lord can make his face to shine upon you. And the Lord can keep your mind and your heart. Stay with the Lord. He says, and in you all families of the earth, of the world, can be blessed. Let me tell you, there are, some, there are some inventions that I came up with, but because I work for a company, they don't even have to put my name on it. They own it. They can dispense it. One particular incident, I went to say, hey, I got an idea. If we do this with this pump and this with this valve, it will come out like this. And he said, oh, that wouldn't work. I mean, three weeks later, they put it on there. And it's labeled by the company name, not by Matthew Davis' name. But I'm all right with it. Because my God in heaven <laughs> knows who came up with the idea. My God in heaven knows who, who, who has been blessed, who has blessed the entire world. And now all over the world, everybody is using this same tool. And it doesn't, have, it doesn't matter if it has my name on it. Forget about whether your name is on it and make sure God is delivering you up before him. And he knows your name. He knows your situation. And he knows how to bless you. Oh, he blessed us over 2,000 years ago. <laughs> Yes, he did. The Bible said mean men attacked Jesus. And he said not a mumbling word. And God was blessing us through his son. He was blessing us because his son was making a way to bless everybody. Mean men arrested him. Mean men killed my Lord and your God. Mean men took Jesus on a star hill called Calvary. They killed him, I tell you. They, they laid him in a grave, I tell you. But all of that Thursday morning, he rose with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. Jesus the Christ, he is here to stay. And let me tell you, he left a legacy for us to follow. And if you're listening to me today, and you never received Jesus as your personal savior, this is a moment. This is your moment to get to know Jesus. He will bless you. And he will allow you to bless others. And he will make, make your name great. And I'm not talking about the name that your mama gave you. I'm talking about servant. Well done. <laughs> You need a name that is above every name to minister to you and to stand in your place. Jesus rose that third day morning with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. If there's anybody here today who have not trusted Jesus as your Savior, would you just bow your head with me and invite him in today? It's very simple. Just repeat after me if you believe the story that Jesus died for our sins. He was buried in a barber tomb and he rose from the dead. The door is open. This is your invitation. Just repeat these words after me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead.
Now come into my life. And make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We believe if you prayed that prayer, honestly believing in the story of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we believe that you're born again. You're on your way to heaven when you die. There may be some others who struggle with sin, who, who every time you look up, sin is having a field day with you. Let me pray with you. Father God, we pray for us. We pray for them. We ask you, Father God, to give us hope, give us strength, give us renewal, rededication, and bless our lives, Father God to be a blessing to you and a blessing to others. So in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. There may be others who are in between church homes or don't have a church home. I recommend this one, the New Beginning Church, where Jesus is the captain of the ship, where Jesus is the main attraction, where Jesus is the center of attention. If you want to join our church, whether you're here or whether you're on the broadcast, you can do so. If you're on the broadcast, just inbox me and let me know you want to join the New Beginning Church. We're located at 4251 Sherman Road, Houston, Texas. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. God has blessed us again. Let's thank God for all he is, all that, that he has been for us. And thank God for what he is already, already doing. We praise God for him for who he is. Just before we take up our offering, I want to ask, um, I guess, two of our sisters to come. Our guests for today, I want to ask the Rose to come forth and, and bless us. And, and let me remind you, this has just become a stage. into the community and talk about the rose. But I didn't know how to do that. And a friend of mine introduced me to, to Pastor Matthew, and he was the first pastor to give me the mic and let me speak. And somebody, I don't know if you're still here, but somebody in the back said amen to something I said, and I knew I was on my way. So I have come back every year to kind of give you an update of what I've been able to accomplish because you guys were the wind beneath my wings. You sent me out there to do wonderful things, and it's because of you and, and certainly God, because he is, I don't even have to worry about my life. He's, he's got me. He's got me in so many different ways. And so this was early uh, 2013, and on October 13, 2013, I met this woman. This star right over here, come on up my star. And together, she and I, and a lot of good folks, have raised over $300,000 for the road. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the roads. We provide mammograms for insured women, uninsured women, and there is information outside for you if you, you're needing a, a mammogram. Um, if that uninsured woman's diagnosed with breast cancer, we get her treatment. So no woman has to die needlessly of breast cancer just because she doesn't have health insurance. And so I saw this woman across, across the table. She knew everybody, everybody knew her. I knew she was a star. So this is my star, Kim Roxy. Um, first given honor to God, uh, to Pastor Davis, who preached a mighty word this morning. Isn't that right? Yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah. Uh, to my role model in life, uh, Sister Carolyn Davis. Um, this was my piano teacher growing up. So um, if you look at me and you see the things I'm doing, a lot of it has to do with this woman right here. Give it up for Carolyn Davis, please. She's not just your first lady, she's my hero, okay? 
um, and giving honor to my little daughter right here, Loretta, who's here with us today, um, and my mother, Chris Noble, who took the role. So in 2014, my mother passed away from metastatic breast cancer. And October 13th is actually metastatic breast cancer awareness day. Yes, it is. Yeah. And so, um, and metastatic um, breast cancer has just been a pandemic inside of the black community before the pandemic happened. And so when I met Chris, we started this work. And because of you, when she told me, she said, oh yeah, I went to this church and she was describing it, told me who the pastor was and the first lady's name. I was like, my piano teacher? That's where you was at? And you know, but that's how you know God is working together like Pastor Davis talked about. Because he works all things together for good. Can I get an amen? amen. He works all things together for good. Can I get an amen? amen. We get back to your life and you let him control everything, you will win in life, okay? And so I'm so grateful. And the work that we're doing at the Rose, um, because you all have made way for a lot of people a lot of people uh, to pay attention to themselves, do their self-exams, and be able to go to the road. So thank you, Mom. Um, and thank you for being on this track with us. And let them know what we got coming up and what we're doing. Okay. I gotta tell you one other thing that God gave me. A granddaughter. And there was, I was not on the track to ever have a grandchild. Seems that I never had any kids. This one calls me almost every day and FaceTimes me and we skydive to New York City and we skydive to, where are we going now, Loretta, California. So, I mean, look at the blessing. Look at this, this, this is my blessing right here, both of these Anyway, you know, we, we've been through this terrible pandemic and, and we're, I, think, I think there's that light, I think we're there, but we're about to have another one and it's breast cancer. The number one risk factor for breast cancer is stress. If you're somebody who hadn't been stressed, tell me how you did it. Um, and, and so I want you to be faithful with your body. I want you to have your annual mammogram. I want you to go and have your, your blood work done and, and stay on top of your health because you have been under attack. By, by your own body, by, by, by the things that have created stress in your life. So one of the places that you can go is to the Rose. If you're uninsured, you can go to the Rose for that mammogram. You do not have to die of breast cancer. And if you've lost your job, you've lost your health insurance, you probably don't know where some of the, some of the clinics are which, that can take care of you. Reach out to me and I'll find you one in your neighborhood. There's some that are very low cost. You don't have to do it forever, but in the meantime, it's, it's a safety net for you. That's why God made those happen, to help you, to not let you fall through the cracks. We, um, Kim and I, are not done yet. We're gonna be parading until she's wheeling me around in my wheelchair. I mean, we're, we're lifelong. We're on this journey together lifelong. And someday we'll get Loretta with us and she'll talk and she'll be talking to her friends. And so, Pastor, I had planned on selling my crosses today. When the pandemic hit, I couldn't go out and talk to anybody, so I had to figure out something to do. And one of the things that I started doing was creating art. And thanks to Kim and a lot of people who bought my art, we've raised about $14,000 for the Rose. I've given away about 300 of my crosses in my artwork to folks. And today, sir, I want to give all the women in this room a free cross. Woo! I happen to have I happen to have 10 of them in this building, and I have some more in my car. So if you, this is our gift, I'm sorry, this is our gift, Kim's and my gift. We give gifts all the time in honor of our moms, who were Lorraine yeah. and Loretta. Yeah. So the hells, we got it made. Yeah. So here's one. Oh, that's beautiful. There's, a, there's an organization, I'm not sure if you know it, called Angels Surviving Cancer. And in 
they're my angels actually. And Kim's mom was one of those, one of those members. But in, in July, not July, in January, they collected jewelry for me and brought me 300 pounds of jewelry. So this is jewelry from the angels surviving cancer. Now how blessed is that? And you can set it up. And so I'm gonna go get the other crosses and I'm gonna set them out outside. Please pick one up, pick the one you like. And I'm pretty sure you'll like about 10 of them, but you can only have one, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think I said Carolyn one in the mail. Carolyn, and Kim and I, Kim and I sent uh, crosses to uh, all the first ladies that helped us along our nine year journey. So thank you so much. I'm sorry guys, I'm giving the crosses to the girls. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor Dave. Amen. If you remember the senior saints uh, in the room, and at that time we included the men, the senior saints, uh, when the pandemic first began, I, I, uh, purchased some of these crosses in the eight and a half by 11 format and I tried to deliver it to every senior saint in our congregation. So we were able, Carolyn and I were able to purchase 25 of, of these beautiful design uh, eight and a half in order to be a blessing to our senior saints. The pandemic has, has made us different and it has made us do things a lot differently and so we need to make sure that we consider the rose make sure that the rose is blessed by us we did our, our walking our running and our cycling promotion for the rose in a fundraiser on yesterday and i was going to tell you how much we gained, but Carolyn said, make it a secret, so you'll find out by Wednesday of this week. <laughs> I always liked her. She's me. She's a little racist. But I can say, our, our goal is $5,000, and we are, we are working it on three different fronts. We have His Place Cycling, we have Turning Hearts Ministries, and we have also New Beginning Church. And so now it is offering time, and we want to give. Yeah, that's a good place to clap right there. It is offering time, and this is a, a moment that we're going to give our tithes, our offering, and we want to make sure that we give a handsome gift to the roads. Uh, we've already, on the cycling front, we've already uh, exceeded what the New Beginning Church usually does every year we always give a great donation every year and we have tripled that amount on the cycling just from one day on yesterday we have we have gone over that triple amount on yesterday just some people contributing uh some contributed by way of the rose uh website others contributed by way of turning hearts uh cash app and uh, those who are gathered here today we want to reckon we want to represent really well from the New Beginning Church. So as you are passed out your envelopes, as you are uh, delivered your envelopes, please write where it says special, uh, write special. I want everybody to get an envelope even if you've already given, even if you're giving online, everybody, please get an envelope and write on the special, write where it says special, write the rose. The rose, the rose, right? The rose. If you, if you would be kind to give to the rose, I just said the more you give, the more the Lord gives unto you. So we want to make sure that everybody receives an envelope and everybody gives by way of the New Beginning Church to the rose. Our goal is five thousand dollars. We're not quite there. But we're going to only take this one offering up and we're going to trust God. Amen. Yeah. Please, ma'am, please, sir, give your tithes and offering to the New Beginning Church. And then put a special offering in there for the Rose. The Rose. The Rose is doing great things. This is a big fundraiser that we, we are doing this year. We've never done it before. And so uh, we're combining with His Place, His Path Cycling as well as turning hearts 
and New Beginning Church are coming together as a consortium to be a blessing to the rose. Amen and thank God. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for this privilege of giving. Lord, we ask you to bless every giver. Bless those who will give their tithes and their offering. Bless those who will give a special gift to the road. We ask you, Father God, to multiply gifts unto them. We thank you, Father God, for the great work of the roads. We ask you to continue to bless Kim, and, and we ask you to continue to bless her daughter. We, we ask you to continue to bless Chris. We ask you to bless their lives, Father God, that will continue to make a difference in the world in which we live. We thank you for every giver. We ask you to bless it in Jesus' name. Amen and thank God. Well, let's just start over here to stand. Follow the first impressions from the real. Bring forth the Lord's tithes, offering of sacrificial gifts, as well as your gifts to the Romans. Sister Davis to come forth and call. We just want to recognize these students and the church, the New Beginning Church has decided to give you money for your aids. Amen. The New Beginning Church will give you money for your aids. My, my, my. We just want to call your name right now and then you can see Sister Davis later on and, and uh, we're going to give you money for your aids. Amen. Cash, cold cash money for your aids. Thank you. Uh, these boys and girls, 99% um, of them, they attend church here at the New Beginning Church, and they attend Zoom Bible study. So we are just really, really excited about them. They, they attend on a consistent basis. And we also have a family in Dallas that attends our Bible study on Zoom. So they will be awarded as well. So we are just excited about Jacob Garza, Gilbert Garza, Braylon Berg, Ashi Orr, Aaron Flores, David Flores, um, Hazelyn Carter, Kevin Malo, Aureli Malo, Daniel Malo, Malo, Sophia, and then we have an adult 
that has had, had her evaluation from her job. And so we're awarding her too, and that is Sister Betty Brown. So you all may see me after church. Thank you. Amen. Amen. So we want to always encourage young people. So Sister Brown is among the young people. We we'll always encourage the young people as they, they go through whatever they go through. We want to make sure we lift these in prayer. And uh, we want to make sure that we continue to encourage them. And this time, the church has chosen to encourage you by financially giving to you for your A's. It's, it's a good thing to be able to make A's. Amen. And I just believe our students, every last one of them, can get A's. No bad conduct, please, ma'am, please, sir. If you have bad conduct, that cancels out and whole A. It cancels out your A if you got bad conduct. Amen. Thank you again so much for being a part. Thank you all for coming. Uh, brother, thank you. give us his name again. James. 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 Thank you for, for being a part of our service. Thank you for joining us, and, and, and they look like they're just tagging together with each other, amen. They just tied, tied together by, by the shoulders, so thank you so much for, for being a part. We were, we were at the park yesterday at 6, 15 ish 6, 30 in the morning on yesterday, and it was pitch black dark. Some of you were snowing, sleeping, and slobbering on yesterday and but we were able to do our ride and our walk for for the glory of god if you want to to be a part uh, please come out uh, on saturday mornings at 7 a.m you have to be there we just started at 7 7 a.m uh you if you have a bike or you can borrow a bike or you want to learn how to ride a bike come on out we're getting our exercise in thank you brother ken bell brother ken bell is one of our cyclists Thank you for, for being here with us on today. Why we stand to be dismissed? Let the church say Let the church say